Morning. Want to talk about alternative input devices? I was having uh, shower thoughts about the the whole joystick versus or uh, game controller versus keyboard input <clears throat> debate type thing. And there are definitely instances where, like controlling vehicles, if you want to continue turning, you have, you know, generally you're moving a mouse around, a mouse pad, to the point where you run out of mouse pad. You know, if you have a helicopter and you want to spin it in circles three times, you're picking up your mouse over and over, and you're getting an inconsistent uh, spin rate. <clears throat> now, the other thing is, of course, the analog input for how much you want to operate your character. You know, your guy just barely walking forward and your guy running forward. You know, there's in keyboard, with keyboard controls, you get a, you get a walk and you get a run, and then you have to kind of tap uh, in between that to adjust whatever that is. So the potential for setting up something, a device with a joystick input that emulates the keyboard output, or a joystick input that emulates the mouse output is pretty easy, I guess. I mean, the work's already done for it. The code's already done for it. We just have to put it together and figure out timing and stuff. But, <clears throat> like, having a, uh, a free joystick, and it would probably be that, that module from uh, the Adafruit module, because that's a, that's a pretty solid, as much as I, you know, I have issues with Adafruit, so philosophy and all that but they are a consistent provider pretty consistent I actually think a couple years ago I said they were inconsistent <laughs> some of their stuff is consistent <laughs> their feather line is really cool and keeps the same form factor and they keep cramming stuff into it it's it's good and they keep trying and if something fails they drop it and move on so <clears throat> I guess uh, discontinuing a product due to lack of interest is not you know, they'd be like, how dare you? <laughs> um, but the potential for, you know, having basically just a, a joystick module and attaching that to, so the other thing is like, it has to be in a, a useful place. Um, so that's why I figure this is something that would be attached via jumper wires to, you know, like extension jumper wires. So you could take the, uh, take the analog input, take the joystick and you know, glue it to your keyboard or make it a tiny self-contained flat module that all it is is just the joystick. So you could really easily reach over and activate it or, you know, while, you're, while your hands are on the keys, reach up and activate it and then like transition back and forth very easily. Um, doing something like that, being able to put the joystick wherever you want is gonna increase the accessibility rather than having like a big clump of PCB that is also the input device that you're going to now have to switch between because you're operating a uh, you're operating a keyboard and you're operating this other device. So I want them to be more more integrated. Uh, certainly, I could build it around the keyboard. That's an interesting idea. Um, <clears throat> but there's there's just such a differentiation. I mean, liter literally, there's a differentiation uh, in in gameplay where people are using mouse and keyboard versus people are using controllers. The game itself uh, adjusts to that values. For the most part, I'm talking about Warzone because that's my primary experience at this point. But having a joystick that when you tilt it all the way to the left, it simulates a mouse constantly moving to the left. Uh, rather than a mouse moving to the end of the mouse pad at a variable speed and then having to be picked up and then put down on the other end of the mouse pad and then dragged over to the mouse pad again. I think that is of significant value. <clears throat> the other thing, oh yeah, like the, the analog input. Being able to just tilt the joystick forward just slightly and get a, uh, a creep or a very small, a very low crawl um, and I do wonder how that works on, on Warzone, because, like, if you move very slowly, you make almost no noise. Uh, but for the most part, you're going at a, you know, the, 
the walking speed or the, the normal speed and then the running speed and maybe there's a slow button so you get three speeds uh, I don't know maybe that's sufficient but the controller or the the joystick controller has definitely has benefits and being able to just tap the key just slightly or maybe under a certain under a certain amount of pressure it's holding down you know slow plus walk and then at a forward amount of pressure you get slow you get normal walk and then at a further pressure you get uh, the run but that's still three settings I don't see why that would be any different it is a little bit more intuitive uh, but you can also do the the eight point movement because you don't just get forward you know up down left right and then up right you know you're, you're not getting the eight of the cardinal cardinal four of the cardinal directions plus four others where you mix them you now you have the opportunity to be move this move this tilt the stick forward and a little bit to the right and then you're getting a forward tapping motion with an intermittent tap on the right key so you're you have more analog control over uh, where your character is moving around in the within the field of the game so I think that might be a value. I mean, definitely the being able to switch to a controller, especially like helicopter controls, if you're switching into a vehicle, um, being able to turn the vehicle. This just kind of assumes there's no vehicle uh, adjustment. There's no like a vehicle button, so you can control where you're looking, but also control where the vehicle's moving. Hmm. I don't know. Let me know what you think. It's, uh, I mean, like I said, it would be something that would be pretty easy to do. And I don't know. I keep being surprised, I guess. I guess I should stop being surprised when people are like, wow, I figured out this game controller. It's a keyboard. This is intuitive and helpful. And I can program the keys. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the party. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, I guess it just, it just really hasn't hit the mainstream, the whole mechanical programmable keyboard, especially one where you can swap out the switches and then, you know, change, and change the location of the switches is, there's a couple things that are doing something similar, which is pretty cool. But those are like, they work on a plate, like a, a, a separate field, and you move the keys around within that field. Gaming is a big market, though. So whatever helps out gamers helps out a lot of people. And introduces them to these new devices and programmability and all that. All of my eyes. This is the sun. This is just... This is just allergies. The the oppression of uh, <laughs> the oppression of pollen just weighing down on my brain. <clears throat> hey, do you mind if I complain about Python some more? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and complain about Python some more. <laughs> they had a, had an additional uh, project the boss wanted me to work on and it's doing uh, email reading and you know aggregating the data and then representing it and making it an, an importable format yeah, ETL essentially so like easy but this time I'm doing it in Python and just the it's just the parentheses man <laughs> Just the parentheses. Having to keep up with the syntax and, you know, what is the object that I'm in right now? And I create a search, and does the search match? Yes, it does. Okay, great. Well, uh, that's the search object. And from the search object, you can request a, uh, a field match. And then from the field match, you can request the output of that field. There's just so many steps. And to be fair, Python can uh, be made into a, a mostly functional style, and I have 
there's a few imperative portions, uh, but I still made it uh, almost completely functional anyway, so it's easier to work with. I also needed to make it, so that's the other thing, I, I want to make it so uh, my boss can uh, adjust it and tweak it if he needs to. So things need to be broken out and named appropriately and uh, readable and commented, things like that. So bits and pieces that are obtuse or confusing should be their own functions anyways because then you can name them very uh, descriptively and then it's easy to it reads more like prose than code <sighs> but just the the little the little fidgets and the little gyrations and I don't uh, all the little bits of syntax that are just dragging you down and making bugs here and bugs there and it's just why just parentheses and I don't, I don't know why people complain about the parentheses hang on a sec okay I don't know why people complain about the parentheses it's just that's that's the only syntax you have and if you don't like the parentheses <laughs> you can macro out the parentheses <laughs> but I guess that is somewhat advanced I mean you can make it I mean that's what that's what the lisp is about it you can make it into your own language you can read it however you want you can make lisp interpret itself into your own language to the point that you're just practi you're, you're practically just writing directly into an inter interpreter into a REPL <clears throat> writing prose straight into a REPL <laughs> but instead we're worried about you know it's a, it's, it's I mean Lisp is typed obviously just it's just more more frustrating somehow <laughs> and it, it can be you know it can be like PHP it's if you if you build bad architecture then yeah hey <laughs> the code looks bad the code feels bad the architecture feels bad but if you if you design it in a functional manner if you design it to to if you design it to feel better if you design it to read better, then hey, it reads better. <clears throat> you take all that, all that crufty stuff, and and bury it into its own function. So, until it become, until it turns into uh, just magic, where you're just passing stuff back and forth and getting outputs. Although main is, eh, you know, whatever. I mean, it has to be somewhat. Uh, <laughs> that that's the joke. It's like. Haskell has no side effects. It also has no output either. <laughs> oh, technically can't see here. It's like no side effects. No data changes. No state. Okay. What do we do with it? Nothing. You look at it. You admire its beauty. Its perfection. It will never change. <laughs> Can we run it? No. You cannot feed it data. <clears throat> I mean, there's always a, the practicality argument, but... <sighs> it's fine. Alright, it's fine. I just... The other thing is, I was... Uh, yesterday, I was tweaking the code, and I was kind of introducing him to it. And uh, I was doing it on the... <clears throat> not in Emacs, so... I was like, oh, gotta mind my white space. Oh, gotta mind my my ending my terminating characters here. Oh, gotta see where the end of this uh, end of this group of you know the end of this function is. Oh, gotta select everything. It's just cumbersome. <clears throat> but cumbersome is, I mean, if I did it in Emacs, you might not have been able to follow along. It's just you know you fly around in in Emacs and in Vim and stuff. That's why the hackers in the movies never use the mouse, because the mouse telegraphs what uh, what's about to happen, and lets the lets the people watching figure out what's going to happen. And if you just mash on the keyboard and the screen changes, and you're like, "Oh, I can't tell what's happening. That must be good." <laughs> but 
But if you're trying to introduce someone to some code and you're trying to navigate them around it in a way that they can follow along, then that's a bad thing. So pick your poison, right? It's always trade-offs. 